Clarence made no reply, for his heart burned within him, as the picture of Wolfe, dying on the blood-stained field of victory, arose to his imagination, and yet, he had a deep inward consciousness, that, after all, there was a truer glory than could thus be won. There were other battles in Canada, after Wolfe's victory, resumed grandfather, but we may consider the old French war as having terminated with this great event. The Treaty of Peace, however, was not signed until 1763. The terms of the treaty were very disadvantageous to the French, for all Canada, and all Acadia, and the island of Cape Breton, in short, all the territories that France and England had been fighting about, for nearly a hundred years, were surrendered to the English, so, now, at last, said Lawrence, New England had gained her wish. Canada was taken, and now there was nobody to fight with, but the Indians, said Charlie. Grandfather mentioned two other important events. The first was the Great Fire of Boston, in 1700, when the glare from nearly 300 buildings, all in flames at once, shone through the windows of the province house, and threw a fierce luster upon the gilded foliage and lion's head of our old chair. The second event was the proclamation, in the same year, of George III as King of Great Britain. The blast of the trumpet sounded from the balcony of the town house, and awoke the echoes far and wide, as if to challenge all mankind to dispute King George's title. Seven times, as the successive monarchs of Britain ascended the throne, the trumpet peal of proclamation had been heard by those who sat in our venerable chair. But, when the next king put on his father's crown, no trumpet peal proclaimed it to New England. Long before that day, America had shaken off the royal government. Chapter 11 now that Grandfather had fought through the old French war, in which our chair made no very distinguished figure, he thought it high time to tell the children some of the more private history of that praiseworthy old piece of furniture. In 1757, said Grandfather, after Shirley had been summoned to England, Thomas Pownall was appointed Governor of Massachusetts. He was a gay and fashionable English gentleman, who had spent much of his life in London, but had a considerable acquaintance with America. The new governor appears to have taken no active part in the war that was going on, although, at one period, he talked of marching against the enemy, at the head of his company of cadets. But, on the whole, he probably concluded that it was more befitting a governor to remain quietly in our chair, reading the newspapers and official documents, did the people like Pownall? asked Charlie. They found no fault with him, replied Grandfather. It was no time to quarrel with the governor, when the utmost harmony was required, in order to defend the country against the French. But Pownall did not remain long in Massachusetts. In 1759, he was sent to be governor of South Carolina. In thus exchanging one government for another, I suppose he felt no regret, except at the necessity of leaving grandfather's chair behind him, he might have taken it to South Carolina, observed Clara. It appears to me, said Lawrence, giving the rein to his fancy, that the fate of this ancient chair was, somehow or other, mysteriously connected with the fortunes of old Massachusetts. If Governor Pownall had put it aboard the vessel in which he sailed for South Carolina, she would probably have lain wind-bound in Boston Harbor. It was ordained that the chair should not be taken away. Don't you think so, Grandfather? It was kept here for Grandfather and me to sit in together, said little Alice, and for Grandfather to tell stories about, and Grandfather is very glad of such a companion, and such a theme, said the old gentleman, with a smile. Well, Lawrence, if our oaken chair, like the wooden palladium of Troy, was connected with the country's fate, yet there appears to have been no supernatural obstacle to its removal from the province house. In 1760, Sir Francis Bernard, who had been governor of New Jersey, was appointed to the same office in Massachusetts. He looked at the old chair, and thought it quite too shabby to keep company with a new set of mahogany chairs, and an aristocratic sofa, which had just arrived from London. He therefore ordered it to be put away in the garret. The children were loud in their exclamations against this irreverent conduct of Sir Francis Bernard. But Grandfather defended him, as well as he could. He observed, that it was then thirty years since the chair had been beautified by Governor Belcher. Most of the gilding was worn off by the frequent scourings which it had undergone, beneath the hands of a black slave. The damask cushion, once so splendid, was now squeezed out of all shape, and absolutely in tatters, so many were the ponderous gentlemen who had deposited their weight upon it, during these thirty years. Moreover, at a council held by the Earl of Loudoun with the governors of New England, in 1757, his lordship, in a moment of passion, had kicked over the chair with his military boot. By this unprovoked and unjustifiable act, our venerable friend had suffered a fracture of one of its rungs. But, said Grandfather, our chair, after all, was not destined to spend. 
the remainder of its days in the inglorious obscurity of a garret. Thomas Hutchinson, lieutenant governor of the province, was told of Sir Francis Bernard's design. This gentleman was more familiar with the history of New England than any other man alive. He knew all the adventures and vicissitudes through which the old chair had passed, and could have told, as accurately as your own grandfather, who were the personages that had occupied it. Often, while visiting at the province house, he had eyed the chair with admiration, and felt a longing desire to become the possessor of it. He now waited upon Sir Francis Bernard, and easily obtained leave to carry it home, and I hope, said Clara, he had it varnished and gilded anew, no, answered grandfather. What Mr. Hutchinson desired was to restore the chair, as much as possible, to its original aspect, such as it had appeared, when it was first made out of the Earl of Lincoln's oak tree. For this purpose he ordered it to be well scoured with soap and sand and polished with wax, and then provided it with a substantial leather cushion. When all was completed to his mind, he sat down in the old chair, and began to write his history of Massachusetts. Oh, that was a bright thought in Mr. Hutchinson, exclaimed Lawrence and, no doubt, the dim figures of the former possessors of the chair flitted around him, as he wrote, and inspired him with a knowledge of all that they had done and suffered while on earth. Why, my dear Lawrence, replied Grandfather, smiling, if Mr. Hutchinson was favoured with any such extraordinary inspiration, he made but a poor use of it in his history, for a duller piece of composition never came from any man's pen. However, he was accurate, at least, though far from possessing the brilliancy or philosophy of Mr. Bancroft, but, if Hutchinson knew the history of the chair, rejoined Lawrence, his heart must have been stirred by it, it must, indeed, said Grandfather. It would be entertaining and instructive, at the present day, to imagine what were Mr. Hutchinson's thoughts, as he looked back upon the long vista of events with which this chair was so remarkably connected, and Grandfather allowed his fancy to shape out an image of Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson, sitting in an evening reverie by his fireside, and meditating on the changes that had slowly passed around the chair. A devoted monarchist, Hutchinson would heave no sigh for the subversion of the original Republican government, the purest that the world had seen, with which the colony began its existence. While reverencing the grim and stern old Puritans as the founders of his native land, he would not wish to recall them from their graves, nor to awaken again that king-resisting spirit, which he imagined to be laid asleep with them forever. Winthrop, Dudley, Bellingham, Endicott, Leverett, and Bradstreet. All these had had their why. Ages might come and go, but never again would the people's suffrages place a Republican governor in their ancient chair of state. Coming down to the epoch of the Second Charter, Hutchinson thought of the ship Carpenter Phipps, springing from the lowest of the people, and attaining to the loftiest station in the land. But, he smiled to perceive that this governor's example would awaken no turbulent ambition in the lower orders, for it was a king's gracious boon alone that made the ship Carpenter a ruler. Hutchinson rejoiced to mark the gradual growth of an aristocratic class, to whom the common people, as in duty bound, were learning humbly to resign the honours, emoluments, and authority of state. He saw, or else deceived himself, that, throughout this epoch, the people's disposition to self-government had been growing weaker, through long disuse, and now existed only as a faint traditionary feeling. The lieutenant governor's reverie had now come down to the period at which he himself was sitting in the historic chair. He endeavoured to throw his glance forward, over the coming years. There, probably, he saw visions of hereditary rank, for himself and other aristocratic colonists. He saw the fertile fields of New England, portioned out among a few great landholders, and descending by entail from generation to generation. He saw the people a race of tenantry, dependent on their lords. He saw stars, garters, coronets, and castles. But, added Grandfather, turning to Lawrence, the lieutenant governor's castles were built nowhere but among the red embers of the fire, before which he was sitting. And, just as he had constructed a baronial residence for himself and his posterity, the fire rolled down upon the hearth, and crumbled it to ashes. 